Well, welcome back to small groups. We've had back to school, now we're having back to small groups. So let's just take a, a moment. Everybody do a little bit of cheering. Woo! You, you guys weren't cheering. I was the only one cheering. Well, anyway, we're going to start out um, our, uh, our time together today. And uh, we're going to be talking about the Psalms. And the Psalms in the Bible are all about these songs and poetry. So let's start out with a few songs that everybody should know. So I'm going to start the song, and you guys are all going to sing the end of the song. All right? My baloney has a first name. It's... Ah, few of you had it. Give me a break. Give me a break. Break me off a piece of that. All right, everybody should have had that one. You know, what's funny is, is that even when it comes to silly little jingles, they, they seem to get buried in our heads. But what's interesting to me are the songs and the music that gets buried into our hearts. So what are the songs we sing communicate about who we are and what we value? And the second question is, what are the songs that your heart most naturally sings? Today we're going to be analyzing four different kinds of psalms. So as you're reading through the book of Psalms, you'll notice that there's different types of psalms. And we're going to go through four of those types so that as you read through the psalms on your own, you can easily recognize what you're reading. And so we're going to start out with Psalm chapter 1. And Psalm chapter 1 is all about delighting in God's Word. And so what I want you to do is have somebody from your group read Psalm chapter 1. But whoever is the designated reader for today, you have to read with passion. So go for it. Psalm chapter 1. Now at this moment, we need to be very honest with ourselves, and I'm hoping that you're willing to be honest with your small group. So when it comes to this first question, is reading God's Word really delightful to you, or is it dull? Because when we read Psalm chapter 1, you know, the psalmist was saying that the righteous person delights in God's Word. But do we really delight in it? And I know that there's been times in my life where I've found reading scripture to be a delight and then there's other times where I've found it kind of dull to be honest with you. So let's be honest and be honest with your group. Is it delightful or is it dull? And describe some things that you would describe as delightful in your own life. Now I want you to think about all the people that you know. Do you know anyone who actually delights in God's Word? And if so, how does it seem to affect their life? Now hopefully you know at least one person in your life that, that delights in God's Word. Perhaps you're in a small group where nobody actually delights in God's Word, you know, but, but hopefully you knew somebody because um, actually there should be one person that you all know delights in God's Word. And I'm not talking about me. I'm talking about Jesus Christ. When we actually read in the New Testament, Jesus loved reading Scripture. Jesus delights in God's Word. And if Jesus needed it, we need it more. I mean, if the Son of God needed to read God's Word and to delight in it, how much more do we need it? How much more do we need to delight in it? And so in an effort to try to, to make God's word delightful in our lives, answer these three questions. How does reading God's word together in church change God's word from dull to delightful? How could you make reading God's word a part of your daily schedule? And how important is it to read the Bible with your family? For this next section, I want you to assign somebody to tell the story of David and Bathsheba. We actually covered this story before the summertime. Just say, have somebody recall David and Bathsheba from memory. 
And what's great about this story is not only do we have the story of David and Bathsheba, we also have Psalm chapter 51, which is David's response to God when he's found out. It's his confession of sin to God. And so after you've talked about the story together, read Psalm 51, 1 through 5, and understand that this is a, a psalm about confessing sin. All right, now I want everybody in here to think of an occasion in which you were wrong. And I know that that may be hard to admit for some of us that we were ever wrong, but think of a time when you were wrong, and deep down inside you knew you were wrong, but on the surface you didn't want to admit it. Perhaps there's somebody in the small group that's brave enough to actually share uh, their, their fault with everybody. Uh, that would be great. And after you guys share with each other about one time where you were wrong and you knew you were wrong but you didn't want to admit it, answer these two questions. What are some of the excuses that we give to justify our sins? And in what ways do we seek to blame others for our sin? One of the things I, I hope that you noticed about Psalm 51 is that David didn't confess sin with a proud heart because confessing sin is done with a broken heart. David didn't have any excuses. He, he wasn't trying to excuse himself. He wasn't trying to say, well, it wasn't that bad. No, there are no excuses when we confess sin. It's something where we're totally broken when we say, God, you are the one in charge. So what is it about David's relationship with God that allows him to confess so freely? A few lessons that we learned from David is that we cannot earn forgiveness. Like there, David didn't try to go to God and say, well, God, I got to make this right. How, how can I make this right? There was no way for him to make it right, right? He was, he was before a perfect God. You can't make it right before a perfect God. And being right with God does not depend on our actions. It doesn't depend on, on our ability to make things right. Righteousness depends on the good character and nature of God. Do you notice in, in Psalm chapter 51, he's, he's calling on God's good nature to be a part of his forgiveness. For this next section, I want you to read Psalm chapter 100. And we're, this is a psalm as, uh, that's about celebrating God. Notice how in Psalm 100, uh, it, it says not just to shout, it says, shout triumphantly. Don't just serve, serve with gladness. Don't just come before God, come to Him with joy in our hearts. But here's my question, what if we're not feeling joy? What if we're not feeling triumphant or glad? Well, are we supposed to talk ourselves into it? The question for the small group to wrestle with is what should we do when we know our heart should respond in praise and joy, but instead we seem cold to God's truth? I want you to come up with some solutions in, in the small group of how we can change that. And once you're done having that discussion, I want you to reread verses 3 and 5 again and see if that helps with the discussion. What I'm hoping you noticed out of verses 3 and 5 in, in uh, Psalm chapter 100 is that God created us and then He saved us. You see, God loved us so much, He, he created us knowing we were going to mess up. And then He saved us so we belong to God. And just the thought of that makes joy begin to creep into my heart. Another truth about God is that God is good and His love for us is eternal. 
But here's a question. If we mess up so much, why does God love us so much? You see, what's important for us to understand is that God doesn't love us because of what we do. God loves us because of who we are. And any of us who have accepted Jesus Christ as our Savior, we are his children. I mean, for those of us in here who have kids, we don't love our kids because they're great at soccer or they're good at math or, you know, they make really good grades. And those things are nice. The reason why we love our kids is it's, well, they're our kids. And that's the way that God loves you, and it's the way that God loves me. I want to read to you a quote from D.A. Carson. He says, God cannot be deceived by religious rituals. He wants his image bearers to enjoy a real relationship with him. So I got a couple questions for you based on that. How do people try to deceive God through religious rituals? And what does a real relationship with God look like? For this last section, I want you to read Psalm chapter 110. And this is all about hoping in the Messiah. Because this is a psalm about the return of Jesus Christ. Now, one of the things I want you to ask in your small group after you read this psalm is, is does this psalm se seem a bit harsh? And how is this psalm supposed to give us hope? Perhaps you noticed in Psalm 110 that it talked about crushing the kings and crushing the rulers and, and it, it talked about heaping up corpses. Well, that doesn't seem very Jesus-like. But one of the things that you need to remember is that this world is filled with evil and injustice. Well, one of the things that we're passionate about at our church is fighting human trafficking, which is a horrible injustice that's happening all around us. And what's interesting is, is it doesn't... It doesn't take uh, a, a very keen eye to see that there are a lot of e there's a lot of evil and injustice in this world, and there will come a day when justice will be done, and Jesus is going to be the one who makes it right. That's what those verses are about. You know, one of the things that we've done uh, throughout this study through through Scripture is that we've been looking at how, even in Old Testament scriptures, that Jesus is, is always hiding within the pages of, of scripture. Well, where is Jesus hiding in, in, the, in the book of Psalms? Well, I want to read a few Psalms to you. Psalm chapter 1, verse 2 is talking about the righteous man. It says, But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and, and on his law he meditates on it day and night. That's about Jesus, because Jesus is the one who delights in God's word. Psalm chapter 2, verse 6. I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. The king whom God the Father has placed on, uh, as, as the king of kings is Jesus. Jesus is the king of kings. Psalm chapter 2, verse 7 says, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Jesus is the one whom God calls his only son. Psalm chapter 22, verse 1. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Do you remember? Those are the words that were uttered by Jesus hundreds of years after this psalm was written. Jesus uttered those words on the cross because Jesus is the suffering servant. And in Psalm chapter 110, verse 1, The Lord says to my Lord, Sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet, because Jesus is the conqueror and the bringer of justice. The way I want you to close your small group today is use Psalm chapter 51, verses 1 through 12, as your closing prayer. 
So what I want you to do is everybody close your eyes and, and bow your heads and you're going to assign one person to read the, that scripture. But don't read it as a scripture. Read it as if it's the prayer of your heart. And when you're done with that prayer, I want you to leave this study with the joy of God's salvation. Have a great rest of your small group and I'll see you on Sunday.